Hi, it's Danny Fleming. And Marcus Collins from MA Properties for our advanced selling strategies masterclass. It's been a while since we've done this. We we always have December off. Um, so the last one masterclass we did was back in November. So here we are now, 11th, 11th of January? 11th, 11th of January. And uh, we're intending to do two online in the next two months and then hopefully get back to in person so um you know it's uh, it's much much easier for us much nicer for us when we're actually physically interacting with people but you know with omicron on at the moment and all of this sort of stuff hey we're but we have done this for two years now <laughs> actually two years in our basement sorry about that we're in our basement doing this so um we really would like to get back and do them in person because as you say it's way more fun for both ourselves and and for the attendees yeah. so, so hopefully two more months and then we'll be back live so the picture there is of our team and let's get going now our logo or our catchphrase whatever is smart moves made here but what do we mean by that so Buying and selling a home is too important to leave to chance and it's too important to let every decision be guided by emotions and first impressions alone. That's why we do these. I mean, it's too important. The, a home that you own is probably the biggest investment that you own. Um, you gotta do it right. So here's where we go. Now, this advanced selling strategies is assuming that you've seen the basic um, the basics masterclasses. Right. Yep. If not, ask questions, contact us afterwards, whatever. Um, we do, we are going to be doing more of those in person, um, in two months time. So you're welcome to join us with those as well. So the agenda for today, part of it is, and we do different content in the basic session, um, and more advanced content in the advanced selling strategies session. So we're not going to cover a lot of the basics that we normally do. But here's the five keys to maximize sales price. This is really important stuff um, for getting the highest price for a home when you bring it on the market. And they cover smart decisions, preparation. What do we mean by all of those? We'll go into those in a sec. Um, staging, marketing, and excellence through teamwork. So what do we mean by smart decisions, Marcus? So relatively easy to get information today. There's a lot of it out there, but what's really difficult is actually to make sense of that, to kind of get, get underneath the covers, if you like, what are the trends that we're looking for, those kind of things. And so we're gonna wrap that up really in, in what we mean by smart decisions. So let me first of all, get the inevitable question, what happened in 2021? and what's going to happen in 2022. So there's a lot to unpack in this one. Um, I am at the moment in the middle of pulling together the market reviews. Yep. Um, I pull those together, then we talk about what the analysis is gonna be on those, and then we'll publish that towards the end of the month. And we have that, that market review, you've probably seen it before if you live in Arlington and Lexington. Um, they are online as well. Um, so if you don't live in those towns, we've got all of that data online, um, I think. But expect to see it in your mailboxes um, in a couple of towns, and that'll be probably sometime early February. But the market review, we're going to do a live stream um, mm -hmm. of all of the content that will be in the market review and really dig down deep as to what's going on with the data um, associated with that. So the live stream is? Uh, next week, uh, Tuesday, we're going to cover Arlington. Um, and then on the Wednesday, we're going to cover Lexington. Going to take about, I don't know, 30, probably when I start talking and we start discussing and tell stories, 45 minutes. But there's a lot to, to, to deal with. We're going to cover uh, single family homes, condominiums, new construction. In Lexington, we'll look at the luxury market. We might even take a look at the rental market too. So we're going to go through and look at all aspects of what happened in 21 yep. and then give you what we think uh, this means clearly because here we are in, in January 22, what that means for 22. So um, next week, uh, yep. Arlington on Tuesday the 18th yep. and then Lexington Wednesday the 19th. And we haven't advertised it anywhere. So, and it, you can't sign up on our website because we don't have a sign up link for it because we only just decided to do this, um, you know, a couple of days ago. If you email me, 
um, danny.fleming at maproperties.com or come to these same links that you've come to for this session, you'll be able to join in. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And once they're, they're done and continuing market updates that we do on a monthly basis, they are all on our blogs, on our blog page, on our website. So yep. you can go and get the information afterwards as well. If you, if you join us and you sort of think, what did they say? Right. So we say we do these every month, but this this is ex- this is the biggie. F- yeah, the first <laughs> one's the, the uh, there's a lot to unpack here, um, and so we will tend to talk a little bit more, cover a lot more detail um, or breadth of it really um, in in a week's time that we would normally every single month up to that. But there we go. So yeah, that's where you get the market update. So the market uh, update that will be in mailboxes as well. So. Um, it's kind of critical to ask those big questions and, you know, unsur- unsurprisingly, you know, trust the people to represent you because what you know will impact your outcome. That's for sure. So let's take a little look at some uh, topics around two of today's buyers and what are some strategies that you can think about as you, you think about bringing your home on the market. So first of all, um, who are today's buyers? This really drives the market. So we got the census data. I guess the last six months ago, over the last six months, um, updated this graph from what I've shown previously. So this is um, population pyramid showing you how many people are in which age bracket. And the males are in the blue and the females are in the red. Does yeah. that say it? No, yeah, no, because this one, this one I did myself. So. Um, so yeah, that's how this one lays out. So two areas are really important. And this, this will, we'll use this and you'll see as, as I go through this, you'll see as we move through the presentation why this, this is important. So two areas are really important. So the, the, the upper yellow bar there is the baby boomers. That is those uh, ch- children born after World War II now getting to, unsurprisingly, retirement age. What that means is they're beginning to downsize. So they're looking to sell the home they're currently in, go to a different town, go to a smaller home, whatever it may be, but they're looking to transition out of the home they're in right now into a different home. So that's one big driver of the market. The other driver is the millennials, the first time home buyers, and that's the lower yellow buy you see there. They are looking to move out of those rentals uh, that they're in right now into their first home, be it a condominium, you know, single family, whatever it is. They're looking to kind of drive. So these two things drive the market. Um, There was one additional effect that isn't shown in the demographics, which is really to do with COVID. And to some extent, it overrode both of those. Both of those effects were in in the market, but there was this move of people for to look for a different home. Where they were living right now didn't really work for them. Um, maybe they didn't need the commute, they needed more space, you know, two offices versus one. They wanted to be closer to family. Whatever those reasons were, there was an awful lot of people moving from where they were previously to where they are you know, now and moving forward. And we haven't really seen that kind of work itself way out of the system. We've clearly seen some of it work its way out of the system. Many of them have already bought a new home, but I don't think we've seen all of it moving out, just looking at the number of buyers there are in the market today. Kind of a sneak peek for next week, I guess. Yes. So we'll stop at that one. But so the big driver though, really these two demographic shifts, as well as this kind of ongoing, but declining, looking for something different from where they live. Um, so that's the real driver in the market. Another question worth asking um, is what is the impact on interest rates? So here's the interest rates. The blue are the historic ones, the, the ones we know, and the green are the predictions. They're not my predictions, but they are the predictions from, I think, an average of three uh, financial institutions. What's interesting is that really low in 2021, upwards of about 3%. And in fact, if you were looking at an arm or something like that, you've got it even lower than that. That looks to be increasing perhaps up to 3.7. Who knows quite what inflation of the Fed is already talking about, what they have to do for inflation more than they anticipated, certainly faster than they anticipated. So it'll be interesting to see how those numbers kind of play out over the course of the year. What is clear though, is that interest rates are beginning to rise um, and that potentially will have an impact on today's buyers in terms of what they can afford. So I wanted to kind of put that in place um, because that will you know, lay into what we talk about moving forward. So 
One inevitable question, and one we never don't really get a chance to look at uh, in the in the ordinary the in monthly the basic, masterclass, basic. Basic. right? Um, is timing a buy and a sell? Um, it's inevitably you know, a, a question that many many sellers have. I'm in an existing home. How do I buy my new home? So let me kind of go through some of the details uh, around that. First of all, though, I want to take a look at the the kind of the seasonality, if you like. We always used to show 2019 data here, but we've updated it for 2021 because seasonality is getting somewhat back to normal. Um, the two kind of orange brownie bars you see there. Um, red. Red. Okay, red. I don't know they're red, but there we go. Um, sort of. Pink. Sort of, sort of yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of a nondescript color, isn't it, yeah. really? Um, the, f the first one, I mean, well, I should say this is the whole of 2021. Um, blue bars are how many homes are listed per month, right? That's all it is. So the first um, orange, blue, red bar is the spring market. Spring slash summer. Right. Um, it starts, depending on the weather, here we are, it's like, what, nine degrees outside, so clearly it's still the middle of winter. Um, it starts sometime in February normally. Um, and it really does depend on the weather. If we get lots of snow, um, then that tends to be pushed out somewhat. If it's a milder winter, it tends to be brought, brought in. But sometime in February, the homes start to come back on the market. Um, and so they grow in kind of March, April. We saw a dip in May in 2021. Normally that's the month when the most homes yeah. come on the market. So there's a little bit of a people bringing their home on the market earlier in yeah. 2021 than they would ordinarily have done. But as you can see, it begins to drop off in that kind of July timeframe. Remembering that it's driven by the school system. You know, when can, certainly in many towns, when do I have to buy a home in order to get my children into the school system? The second red bar is the fall market. As you can see, really, really short, um, September, October, and then we start to get into Thanksgiving and Christmas and winter and everything else kind of life kicks in. Um, and there's a lot less homes, but it's definitely there. There's definitely a peak in that second half of the year. And we should point out that in normal times, normal seasonality, not COVID, August is traditionally very, very quiet because people right. are going away, they're going on vacation before yeah. school starts, all of this sort of stuff. Sellers aren't bringing their homes on the market. But this, this last couple of years, our normal seasonality has shifted quite a bit. Although, as Marcus said, 2021 is getting a lot closer to what our normal seasonality is. Normally, August would be very, very reduced and almost half the number of homes that came on this August would normally come on. So August, we want to avoid typically. So wh why do we show you this, this graph? So when is the best time to be a seller? And when is the best time to be a buyer? So talk about the buyers, first of all. The best time to be a buyer is when there's the maximum number of homes on the market. Looking at this graph here, that would be April, May, June. That's the best time to be a buyer because you have more choice. Um, the best time to be a seller is when there are buyers in the market, but there are not that many sellers. And you can see here, that's in that February, March timeframe. So the best time, assuming you had it in an ideal world, you really would want to put your home on the market in February and March, but then look to buy your new home in April, May, June. So that's why we kind of put this, this out, because this has an impact on not, less, not just timing a buy and a sell, but what's the right way to time a buy and a sell? And ultimately, the right way to time a buy and a sell is to sell at the right time and buy at the right time, if that's possible. And typically, when there's low supply and high demand. Right. You know, basic supply and demand scenarios. So, um, how do we kind of, kind of lay this out? Um, there are a number of different scenarios that you can play out. Um, you know, such that, such as, I should say such that, such as you have somewhere else to move. You already bought something. Perhaps you're moving to that home that you bought many years ago in New Hampshire or Maine or Florida for that matter. Um, the other scenario is that you would, you can buy without needing to sell, although you would rather not. You don't necessarily want to carry two homes, at least for very long, 
but you could if in a push you could do that and then the other one of course is that the more difficult one uh, unsurprisingly is that you need to sell in order to buy so let me kind of go through that mm -hmm. I'll put them in a, in a graphical mm -hmm. form and I'll kind of go through them quite quickly the devil is is clearly in the detail this is a broad brush in terms of how you should do this if your situation may not fit these it'll fit one of these to some extent um, but you know that's a time that you know reach out to us and say well that's great Marcus but here's my actual situation how, how should I approach it so that's kind of the way to look at what you're going to see in the next four or five slides so first one is you have somewhere somewhere to move so the idea here of course is that in all of these I should say buyers on the top sellers at the bottom so you're buying a home on the top you're selling on the bottom so you bought the home, you've closed, everything's good, and now you're in a position to wait to bring your home on the market that maximizes your sale price, essentially. Back to what we were saying about seasonality. For example, this may be that you closed on a home in October or November, you might carry your, your home you're selling for those few months over the winter months, and then you bring it on the market in that February, uh, time frame, probably or March time frame, that might be a good example here. So that's kind of mm -hmm. the game that we're playing, if you like, in terms of this. So that's an easy one. Um, in the case of buying without needing to sell, you kind of, you know, do something similar. You get an accepted offering on your existing home and then you bring your home on the market quickly because you're looking to coincide the closing of your buy and the closing of your sell. But if you can't, for example, um, maybe you find a home when you're not really ready to bring your home on the market. Um, you can still do that because you can do either one. You can kind of carry either you can buy early or buy late. So that's kind of how this one plays out. The more difficult one, of course, is where you absolutely have to coincide the buying and the selling. That's the more difficult. Um, you could buy with a home sale contingency challenge with a home sale contingency which basically says you know I'm looking to sell my home but it's contingent on something it's contingent on me buying um, the challenge with that is that in a strong market and as you'll find out next week and as I'm sure many of you have, have heard anecdotally if, if nothing else this is a very strong market a home sale contingency or any contingency for that matter is difficult for a buyer so you can say can something. we clarify because sure. you did sort of reverse it a little bit there what Marcus is talking about is you making an offer to buy a home and that offer is contingent on you selling your home so know. that you, right. you, you reversed it before. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. go back to that. Okay. So that's where right. the seller won't be very inclined to take your offer because, hey, there's lots of other buyers out there. Everybody wants it. I'm not going to take an offer where now I have to worry about them selling their home as well. So that's that's pretty tough in a in a strong sellers market that we're in now right so sorry but so he's my husband i'm allowed to crit uh, yeah, yeah. i'm allowed was, to <laughs> my wife always does she enjoys it i think uh, deep down there's this kind of there's some psychological Ooh, I've got psych a, I've got psychological things going him. on there right let's not go there don't we? Uh, <laughs> so um now next one really is selling first and then you buy that is you put your home on the market um, you get an accepted offer on it and at that point you start to look for a, for a home. The challenge with this one is that what if you can't coincide those closings? What if you can't find a home to buy? Because it's a tough market to buy. Relatively straightforward to sell, not as straightforward, more difficult to, 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 to buy in this market. So what if you can't do that? You know, one option that we've had um, sellers do this is they, they go and rent a house. Um, so they look at the situation, well, I'm not, you know, I want to give myself a little bit of flexibility here in terms of finding the right home to buy. So if I can't coincide the closings, guess what? I'm simply going to rent for a few months to put me in that situation. Or you ask for a long closing, or right? you do what um, one of our agents just had an accepted offer, Rachel um, had an accepted offer on a home yesterday, and the sellers um, wanted to close quickly, but rent back until right. June, mid-June. So, so that's a long closing there. So you, you yep. bring your home on the market very early here, mid-January, but you're looking to, to to uh, move, Not out. move out yeah yeah looking to move out yeah in that kind of at the end of the school year but basically. that also gives them a lot of time to find a new home to right. buy right so that's 
Um, a couple of other things you can do. One is you know the long closing with that kind of rent back. Rent backs, in general, some buyers are, are somewhat reluctant to yeah. do that. In a strong market, they'll kind of yeah okay I'll do it. In a in a as the market begins to normalize it as inevitably it will. Some buyers are somewhat reluctant to kind of yeah. buy a home and then have the seller rent it back. So yeah, that works in a strong market, not necessarily. Because it complicates things. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's say the buyers have closed on the home. They own the home. The sellers are still in there. Well, what happens when the dishwasher breaks down? Who? Right. Who? You essentially who become a landlord. The you don't you know, necessarily that, want to be a landlord. You want to be a homeowner so at the end of the day. Most yeah. attorneys will recommend not doing that because it does complicate issues. You had someone um, yourself mm -hmm. uh, a couple of years back yep. um, where the, the sellers rented back yep. and you it couldn't ended, get them out. Right, and you ended up in a small claims court in the end. So it's not necessarily yeah, it's straightforward. Not I mean, it, yeah. you say you, you want to be a homeowner, what you end up becoming is a landlord. And that's not what the vast majority of people want to be. Yeah. So that that's kind of the the today you can you can do it because it's a strong market, not necessarily perhaps in, as the yeah. market begins to normalize. You know, one other thought um, around this one is is a bridging loan. That is, you close on the buy, but then you take out a bridge loan until you can close on the sell. That until you can free up the money. It requires you kind of carry two mortgages. Um, but the idea here with this one is that you keep that period where you are carrying two homes as short as possible, perhaps a couple of weeks to maybe a couple of months, but really no longer than that, really keeping that very low. And, met, and a number of lenders will actually roll that bridge loan in with the loan that you're using to buy your new home. So they'll, the, you, the mortgage lender you're using for your buy will also, in some cases, you know, furnish the bridge loan as well. So that's one option there. So there's a lot of different scenarios there. Mm -hmm. I mean, three or four, in fact, you know, if you think about the, the rent back as well, in terms of the more difficult one of, I have to coincide my my, my um, buy and my, my closing, my, my sell, excuse me. Um, but the devil very much in the detail there. So if you look at that and it's like, I didn't really follow some things you were saying, you know, Marcus, then, you know, reach out to us and we can be yeah. more than willing we to kind of go through more. this once we understand your situation and explain exactly what kind of yeah. works for you. Yeah. So. Cool. Next is pricing strategy. I get to talk yeah, for a little bit now. Danny, I get, yeah, can I, can I criticize? <laughs> Yeah, no. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, so let's talk about pricing strategy. This is really, really important. First off, you want a detailed, accurate market analysis with a recommendation from the agent. Um, that's really important because you don't want to guess at this because if you guess wrong, it, it does impact the resultant price that you get. Um, in fact, I, I was in Australia just recently helping my mum um, get uh, one of her homes on the market and the agent came in and he's a very good agent, but he's, he was honest, which was fantastic. And he said, look, there are so few comps for this sort of home. I don't know what it'll sell for. And so we went through them and, and we, we did come up with something at the end that we think, yep, yeah, you know, um, I think it'll probably go for there. But he was honest about it. But most of the time we have comps um, and a, a strong recommendation for where we believe the, the market value of the home will be. But it's really important to point out, you decide the price for your home. You decide what price it comes on at. But it's really important to understand the experience of your agent um, and to understand how often they do this and how much they know about the market. Um, because overpricing will kill your resultant price. If you realistically price, and we're not talking about underpricing, we're talking about realistically pricing, you will get often over market value for the home. Let's just, before we get more into that, I thought it would be important to show you what the impact of the 2021 market was. Now, this is some data. Here we've got 2020 and then 2021. This is in one town, one specific town in the area. Now, this is a sales, a distribution of sales, um, sales price to list price ratio. So 
as you sort of see in this one, you've got 100%. Okay, that's where the asking price is actually what the home sells for. But look at, look at this in 2020, which was still a strong market, 49% of those homes that came on the market sold for below the asking price and 51% sold for over the asking price. Now, move one year forward. Look at this. In 2021, this same town where the year prior, 50% sold for below, 50% approximately sold for above asking price, 72% sold for over asking price and only 28% sold for below the asking price. That's the difference of the market conditions that we had in 2021. Anyone that we were talking to in 2021, we were giving them the same advice that we ourselves personally were using. We actually sold a couple of our rentals that we had because the market was so strong, it was time to capitalize on the market. We knew that the market was doing this and you would have too if you had have been joining us with the market updates and things. But we actually capitalized by selling in the 2021 market too. But look at even in this hugely strong market, have a look, one home sold for 74% of the asking price, the original asking price. And here's one here that sold for 142% of the asking price. That's a different feeling. If you just imagine yourself as a seller and you're getting 74% of what you put the home on the market at and you thought your home was worth, you're pretty down in the dumps. It's not a very pleasant selling experience. Yet if you're that seller that, get it, that gets anywhere over 100% for your home, yes, the buyers love my home. And that's the key, that's the key dynamic here. The buyers love your home. And when the buyers love your home, it becomes a, a more of a win-win situation for both the buyer and the seller. They're absolutely tickled pink that they actually got a home in this incredible market and you're tickled pink that you got such a great strong price for your home. Let's have a look at the impact of days on the market with the, the sale price to list price ratio. So, this line here, this 100% line is the 100% sale price to list price, comes on the market at a million dollars, sells for a million dollars. Um, you'll see that very typically, and this is real data being mapped, the longer a home is on the market, the trend line is down. Um, you will typically get the highest price for a home in the first week that it's on the market. Once you've been on the market for a week, the buyers are now starting to think, hmm, I wonder what's wrong with this house. Nobody's buying it. Hmm, I wonder, and, and it gets worse and worse as time goes by. You'll see a couple that are over the 100% line. They were new construction. By the time they sold, the buyers had gotten a basement done or some additional extras. So they were just a couple of outliers of data. This is the important part, is the first week that the home's on the market. So what do we mean by realistically price? Again, I was sort of saying, don't underprice. It's just realistically pricing. It creates excitement because the buyers are going week after week after week, looking at homes that are on the market, they know what the prices are. So when something comes on the market and they know it's realistically priced, it's Oh, I really like this house. We have an app and we'll show you that um, in, a, in a little bit, but um, we, our sellers know what activity is happening on their home, real time. They know what activity is happening in the home. And the metrics that we have are that if we see 40 plus online viewings of the 3D tour in the first couple of days, it typically tightly correlates with 20 plus private showings being scheduled on the home. And that tightly correlates with two plus offers on the home. And we see this week after week after week. Now, when you realistically price, we set an offer deadline. It doesn't just go on for in perpetuity. 
We typically bring a home on the market on the Thursday and we review offers on the Tuesday. The, there are some listing agents that will sort of say, yeah, we'll review offers on the, on the Tuesday, but we'll take offers beforehand. That's, that's doing such the wrong thing because the buyers will make an offer, a cheaper offer first, because they don't want to wait until Tuesday because they know they'll have to pay more money on Tuesday. So if a seller takes an offer before that deadline, they've lost money, um, which is really sad. What we find when we have competing offers, and why is this important? Why is it important to realistically price? If we have multiple offers, if we have over five offers, often we find um, at least 25% of them, no, 75% of them don't have an inspection contingency. A large number of those offers won't have an inspection contingency. They're taking the house as is. Um, and we probably see about the same sort of ratios uh, of buyers that are dropping their mortgage contingency. Now it's not saying, a lot of people mistakenly think that if there's no mortgage contingency, it's a cash offer. It's not. A, drop, a buyer dropping a mortgage contingency is the buyer being so confident that they're getting a mortgage and that they won't have any problems getting a mortgage, they're not making their offer contingent on getting a mortgage. Um, when we have multiple offers, typically if you've got buyers competing with each other, they are paying over market value. It becomes more the, the psychology of the buyer is how much do I need to pay to get this house? I, I'm going to pay as much as it takes because when a buyer is writing an offer on the home, they're falling in love with it and psychologically they've worked out where they're going to put their sofa and where they're going to put this and which bedrooms, the, you know, Johnny's and how they're going to, you know, have their guests come over and for dinner. And it, it, it's, it's important psychologically. The number of offers is important. Um, so it, it realistically pricing is key. You don't want to just end up with two offers on a home because if two offers on a home, and I know that sounds really, really stupid, um, the, you know, you don't want to end up with two offers on your home on the Tuesday because that's fantastic that you've got two offers four or five days after you come on the market. but it often isn't as high an offer, the resultant offer isn't as high an offer that you could have gotten if you had six offers on it or more. Um, it happens across all price ranges, um, even over $2 million. We, we bought a home on the market um, in early November uh, for $2 million and we had, I think it was 11 offers on the home and it sold for Two million two hundred and seventy thousand. So this happens at all price ranges, not just the sub one million dollar prices. So okay, that's realistically pricing. What what about if I want to overprice? Because a lot of different generations believe that you've got to come on at a price above, and then the buyers will negotiate you down. Yes, that is one technique. It's not a good technique um, because. Well, overpricing, it's a bad move because the buyers know the value of your home. A lot of people think that if I come on at a high price, the buyers will just come in with a lower offer. That's fine. Um, you know, that's fine. But the challenge is, is those buyers aren't even coming to see your home. Um, and it's only if it's been on the market for a long time and they think, hey, I can get a deal here. Maybe I'll go in and see this home because they'll take a lot less. Um, small reductions in price don't, don't do anything. Um, if, if the home is overpriced, a large, re a large reduction in price will stimulate activity if it falls into the market value range. Because as I say, the buyers know um, when the home is overpriced. Um, any offers that come in when you've overpriced will always have a home inspection contingency. Always. That's a typical, an offer typically has a home inspection contingency and a mortgage contingency. The only way you don't have those 
is if a buyer is competing with other buyers and they're trying to make their offer more attractive by waiving one or both of those contingencies. That's the only time you will potentially have no inspection or a no mortgage um, offer. But it's also that the buyer has the upper hand in, in terms of, in the terms and conditions, you know, they may want to close in three months time. If you want to sell your home, you might just have to take what the buyers are offering because the buyers have the upper, upper hand. It's far better be in, to be in the situation where you've got lots of buyers clamoring to buy your home rather than a disinterested buyer that's, I'm going to see how much how, how, how low a price I can get. Yep. Here's a, here's, I wanted to show you um, a couple of scenarios. Here's a recent example of an overprice. This home came on the market um, the 20th of July. Oh, and it was purchased by one of the agents in our team, Rachel Grabowski, and 74% sale price to list price ratio. She got a great, um, a great home for her buyers and they didn't budge um, until they could negotiate where the, the home, you know, negotiated a good price of the home. But look at this, look at the history. It came on for $2,250,000. Less than, well, 10 days later, it dropped $250,000. Still didn't sell. A month later, it dropped another $300,000. So remember we was, I, I was commenting that the large reductions will only have an impact if it's dropping the home into the market value range. So even with the first $250,000 price reduction, didn't do anything. The second $300,000 um, price adjustment finally had some impact um, and nine days later, um, the home went under agreement. But there was an inspection and a mortgage contingency and the, the buyers um, were able to get money back off the inspection because there were certain things found that were, were a challenge with the home. So this is indicative of what happens when you overprice. Here's another one. Um, I actually did a market analysis on this home and my market value range was 18 to 1850. Sellers didn't like my market value range. Someone came in with a higher price. We call that buying a listing because, you know, the agent has it on the market for longer and signs out front and it's advertising the agent. But it came on for 2,095, way too high. They then dropped it to 1875 but by then the home had been on the market for 64 days and even at 1875 which was just a little over the market value range still no activity then four months later they dropped it down into the top part of where my market value range was it had been on the market too long it was stale at that point it came off the market um, after 250 days and then it came back on the market on 227, um, beginning of February. Remember, we were saying that's the prime time to come on the market. And it came on at 1788, well below the market value range uh, in, in that period of time. And after 72, 72. days, it finally sold for 17. Market value range, when I first went to see them, was 18 to 1850. There's a loss of about hundred thousand dollars there um, because they overpriced. So please don't overprice. That's and eighteen months. It took and eighteen, 18 months. months. Yeah. For that one to sell in the yeah. end. Yeah. Um, we see this these examples day after day after day, um, and it's really sad. It's sad for the seller because they weren't getting the right advice to begin with, or someone was buying the listing, or or it was an inexperienced agent who didn't know um, the pricing of the home. So let's get on to preparation. This is also one of the, the key components to maximizing your sales price. This is really, um, you know, the, because the buyers want move-in ready. 
they want to be able to just wheel their suitcase in the door and unpack. They don't want to do anything because they don't know who to call. They don't, they don't have the extra money. They've spent, you know, all of the money to, to even buy the home. But let's first talk about, before we get into preparation, we should talk about downsizing or decluttering because preparation, to do some of the preparation, you need to not have as much shit around. Should I swear? I, sh I shouldn't swear. Um, you shouldn't have much junk around. There you go. Much junk around. Clutter. <laughs> um, clutter around. Um, but downsizing, you might be moving out of a larger home into a smaller one. Um, well, how do you do it? And this is part of the things that we'll give you guidance on, on how to do it, where to start, and, and um, how it's done. But it's important because... It's important to do it while you have time to do it. You might not be thinking about selling for six months. We'll start the, the decluttering, the downsizing now because it'll make your life an awful lot easier um, when it's time to come on the market. And if you leave it until after your home's under agreement and you've got, say, a six-week closing, all of a sudden, the last six weeks of you owning your home is frantic because you're trying to figure out what to do with everything and where to, to do it. Um, the sale of furniture. Well, we can provide resources. We can suggest techniques. We can um, talk about methods of how to do it. Um, there's a whole lot of different scenarios and different techniques. I just said that. Different techniques to do it. Um, well, well, first off, let's let's talk. I should have split them into categories. Typically, most people have, if you're not taking some of the belongings to the next house, it's either you want to get money for it, you want to donate it, or it's trash. Um, typically, that's, that's where it is. Um, donate to family or organizations. There's lots and lots of organizations around that will um, take uh, your goods, that will give them and um, don't um, reassign them to people in need. Um, we can give you the names of those companies. Um, it, it depends on where you are and, and what you're donating. Um, trash, how do you do it? Well, it depends on how much you've got to remove and, um, and there, there are different options. So start talking to us well in advance and we'll get you going on those sorts of things um, and explain how to do them. Maybe we should actually do a downsizing masterclass. Because there's also the advice on organizers. There are yeah. people who's, who, whose job it is is to guide you through what, could, what seems like a relatively straightforward process, but once you start throwing some emotion into it, and inevitably you do, because you're looking to get rid of some of your belongings yeah. you've had for a long time, it can be quite challenging for people. And there yeah. are, we, we have a number of people who kind of help you through that process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's there's a lot to you yeah, know, maybe, those three things and, we'll, and how you actually do it. Maybe we'll do a masterclass on <clears throat> downsizing. So so yeah. stay tuned. Um, <laughs> I won't commit to when we'll do it now while we're doing this. Um, but so let's get into preparation. Once you've cleared out some of the stuff that you don't want, now it's time that you can actually get to the walls. For instance, if it's going to be painting, if you can't get to the walls because there's so much stuff everywhere, that makes it tough. But there's no one answer fits all with this. Um, we typically tell people or suggest to people not to do major renovations. And major renovations mean replacing the kitchen or uh, updating a bathroom or things like this. Don't do those sorts of things unless you're going to be the, in the home for two or more years. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a lot of turmoil and there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot of other high return on investment things that you can do that aren't high cost. Um, and we'll give you the advice on which ones they are. We'll also give you the advice on the priority order. You know, start here and if you get time down here, great. But so long as you've done these <clears throat> to begin with. And we're often giving people advice on things not to do, projects not to do, because they won't... You know, you might spend ten thousand dollars on doing something, and it's not going to give you. You know, it may not even give you a ten thousand dollar increase in sale price. What we want to do is suggest the things that 
may cost $5,000 to do and may give you a $50,000 increase in sale price. They're the one. <clears throat> excuse me, they're the ones that you need to do. They're the, the important ones and we can help you with them. Um, and when I say we can help you with them, we we have our, our listing team. Um, we can help provide contractor resources. We can tell you who's really good at the moment, who's really responsive. We can help you get quotes for the work to be done. No problems, that's easy to do. We can help coordinate the contractors and when you know they're coming in and timing and get them in to, to come and work on the home. And we can also oversee the project in conjunction with you. Um, it, it, but it's you get to decide the level of assistance you want. You might just want the names or you might want us to do everything. We, um, we were selling a home a couple of years ago and he wanted us to do a lot. Um, so. Sorry? The seller wanted us to do a lot. Yes. Did, what did I say? He. Oh, he. The seller. Uh, I don't know who he is. <laughs> um, and he, we coined the term, he called it, uh, he said, I just want to be an interested observer. Okay. So we did, did it all. And he, he, um, his home was over $2 million and we had competing offers for his home too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So it depends on you as to how much we'll do. But they can range from things like, just decluttering, advanced packing, putting it in boxes, putting it, put it, you know, you're going to have to do that when you're moving anyway, so why not do it in advance? Touch up, touch up paint um, on walls and trim, shampooing carpets, uh, removing wallpaper and painting neutral colors. Um, get us in to talk to you about colors though, because we did have one, one seller who, who planned to, to do this and did this, and when I went in, they had painted the, the walls bright orange and bright green and bright blue. You want neutrals, that's, that's important. Um, landscaping, and sometimes just a little bit of mulch. Uh, minor repairs. It, minor repairs is really only necessary if something's pretty obviously broken, um, because the buyers do pick up on that. Um, paint over. Dated bathroom tiles. I'm going to show you some photos of these. Painting over older kitchen, bathroom cabinetry, um, wood cabinetry. These are the sorts of things that if you've got an older kitchen, an older bathroom, don't renovate them. Don't, uh, don't spend a lot of money doing this. Just painting them. Painting them makes a huge difference. Um, sometimes removing carpets if there are hard, hardwoods underneath. But it depends on the level or the degree um, of where the home is and what makes sense to do. So don't just assume we're going to suggest all of those things. We might just suggest touching up paint and that's it. The house is really good. Um, we might suggest, you know what, if you painted some of the bathroom cabinets, this would make a huge difference. Um, so. The, our recommendations are specific to every house, so don't just assume that all of these things are what we're going to suggest. Um, but there's a few options available. You know, you can do nothing. Buyers and developers will compete for homes. There are people around all the time looking for a home that needs work so that they can put the money in and flip the home. And they compete for them too. Um, or you can do- This year, the, almost the highest sell price to list price ratio, um, and it was well over 140%, um, was yep. for a, was developers competing for a home that came on the market. Um, so that's kind of, I thought that was interesting that your home came on the market, um, yep. developers saw it as an opportunity, homeowners did too, um, but at the end of the day, the developers beat the homeowners, were willing to pay more than a homeowner, and it sold for 40% over the asking price. Yep. So it's, there's no question in this very competitive market, yep. buyers as well as developers will compete for homes. So yep. bear that in mind as, uh, as you're thinking about you know, um, bringing your home on the what market. What your home needs, what, right. what you know, the condition of your home, and do you want to sort of spend money on it? Sometimes it's not necessary, so, and we'll give you that advice based on your home. Um, you can do minor cleanup and cosmetic improvements. Again, the buyers who want move-in ready, that's what appeals to them. If you're going to do updates, 
spend it wisely. Don't, don't replace the insulation in the home. Buyers could care less. Um, if you're going to, to, to spend money, spend it wisely. Um, let's see, here's some examples. So this um, before photo, um, it, it, this was a home I went into and the sellers were getting ready to bring it on the market. Well, they'd been talking to another agent um, who was getting ready to bring it on the market in a week or two weeks time. It, you know, it wasn't listed with that agent, but they'd been talking to that agent and that was the time frame that they were talking about. And I, uh, their, their son had called me in um, because he'd heard uh, heard about us. And I came in and I said, look, you really can't come on the market in your current condition. Um, because they were on a very, very, they had a very, very steep driveway. I said, you've got to make the home appealing to the buyers. Otherwise, they're not even going to come into the home. Um, here's just one example, though, of, of the photo. They ended up taking my advice and we painted the walls. We painted the trim. We painted the kitchen cabinets, all of this sort of stuff. But you'll see the difference in the wood trim and how it looks when it's painted white. Because painted white is what all of the builders are doing, all of the new construction, everything, the modern, the modern appeal to a home, to the buyers, is white trim. As soon as you see wood trim, it dates a home. So we didn't even change the carpet, it had green carpet, but just painting the walls and painting the wood trim. We had competing offers on it and I think we sold it for 35% over the asking price and the sellers were blown away. But that's the difference with what um, it makes. Wallpaper. Taking off wallpaper and painting makes a huge difference to a buyer because um, most buyers don't like wallpaper. Um, and a buyer walking into a home that has wallpaper is ticking over money in their head as to how much it's going to cost to, to remove it. I once had a buyer tell me um, with a home that we had a little bit of wallpaper still on, on, on the walls that it was going to cost him $20,000 to take off the wallpaper and paint it. And I'm, no, you could do this easily for less than $2,000. And he looked at me and he said, you just want to sell me the house. They have no... A lot of folks don't have any understanding of how much things cost to do and they will often attribute a far higher cost to doing something than it, it actually is. So remove that, remove that um, objection from them straight away. Here's another one, wallpaper removal. Um, it just makes it, it, it feel fresh. Um, this was a home that uh, we, it was an estate sale. Um, a friend of ours in Malden, um, her husband owned this home and she'd never seen it. Um, they had been newly married two years or so. Uh, he passed and she called me in to come and have a look at the home. It had been a rental, a long-term rental. And this was the condition of the home of one of the rooms, uh, one of the bedrooms when we walked in and uh, she was aghast. But with paint and we actually removed the carpet because it was really in rough shape and put down sheet vinyl, it comes up pretty well. Um, and we ended up having competing offers on that home as well. But here's another one, wallpaper removal, but look at the laminate table. Um, it paints, paints up really good we remove the curtains. Here's something I mentioned before, the tiles um, in a bathroom. They date a home, but look, they get painted and the paint makes a huge difference because if a buyer was going to walk into that bathroom, the, the original, they're going to sort of think, oh, I need to update this. God, I need to update this. Okay, it's gonna cost me money. When they walk into this bathroom, okay, that's good. I can live with this, this is fine. We, we can update it at some point in the future. Um, here's another one with tiles painted. 
Um, and here's the laminate cabinetry um, painted as well with the tiles painted. Another example, the tiles and the laminate comes up so much fresher. Here's one that um, we actually did ourselves. Um, this was a home that we bought as a, as a renovation project, um, but we were going to uh, rent it out and, uh, and things, but we decided to update the bathroom in the kitchens here because we were keeping it for a number of years. And so this was the finished product um, of this particular bathroom, appealing to, to buyers. Um, here's an example of this is is a photo of a home that had been on the market for 103 days not selling with another agent um, they asked me to come in and talk to them about selling and I sort of said we need to paint your kitchen cabinets um, that's sort of pretty important that's what the buyers are like at the moment um, anyway we did that that was all we did in the home um, and we had competing offers on the home. So, you know, they were pretty happy. Um, here's another example, an older kitchen with older wainscot, uh, wood kitchen. Um, see the blue countertops? We left the blue countertops alone. We left the appliances alone. We just painted the kitchen cabinets um, and painted the, the wainscoting, um, competing offers on it. Here's another one. Um, this one, we did, this was a home um, in a very prime location. Um, so we did a little bit more to this kitchen. We didn't do so much to the rest of the house. We just did some to the kitchen because that was what was going to, to sell this home. And this one, I think it came on the market for 1.1 and sold it for 1402. So it was... <laughs> That yeah, happened, it was, it, it? Right. we had a dramatic um, improvement in that. But that's just painted these, these older kitchen cabinets with new um, cabinet hardware and um, some granite counters and some different appliances. Um, this is the one I was telling you about before that we painted the wood trim and the walls and it was coming on the market with a different agent. Well, they were talking to a different agent about coming on. Um, here's the, the original and here's the painted kitchen cabinets. We didn't do anything with the appliances, just painted the cabinets and you can see the difference that just paint makes. Um, here's a before. Um, this was an estate sale and two agents had told um, the estate attorney that it was a teardown and builders were coming in with really low offers. Um, we recommended coming in, the, the house had great bones. Um, we recommended paint, refinishing some floors, landscaping, minor repairs, and we had competing offers on the home and sold it for way over what the builders were, were, were talking. Um, Here's an example of a home. Actually, that was the home. That was the home in the previous shot, um, in the previous slide. This was the exterior. Um, this was, you know, when you see this, you can imagine why people thought that it was a teardown, but it had great bones. So we just got some landscaping done as well. And here's what it ended up looking like. And it appealed to the buyers. Landscaping can make a difference. Um, here's one where it was very, very overgrown out front and it was very dark inside the home. Um, here's the difference with just taking out a couple of those trees and opening it wide up. And look, in this one, you can't even see that there was a side entrance to the home. Um, made a huge difference competing offers on the home. Here's another one, and this is the last one of the preparation ones, and then we're going to get on to, to the, the impact staging has. This home had been a for sale by owner. Um, then it was on the market with another agent for about a year, and then it was a for sale by owner again, and then they listed with us. 
We didn't do much inside. We did stage the home, but we got them to take out these, these two trees here. And then we got to painting the garage doors and the trim. That's all we did with the, the outside of it. But the difference in how the home appeared to buyers, we had competing offers on, on it and sold for over the asking price. So it's not just, so as we were sort of saying before, every home is different. Um, this one was a minimal cost to actually do the work and we got competing offers. You've just got to pick what is, what is it that's going to pull the buyers in. Um, so now let's get into staging. I feel like I'm talking too much. Um, staging. It's really important to wow the buyers when they walk in the door. When you've got the buyers walking in the door and, oh, wow, I really like this house. Then you, you, you're going to get a great price for your seller. And it's sold. Yeah, you've got a great price for your seller. So mm. here's the home that I was telling you about in Malden that was a friend of ours, um, the estate sale. This was the living room when uh, we walked into the home with some paint, okay, made it feel better than it was, but look at the difference when it was staged. Now it's walking into a wow home. Now this is a, a low cost home, but the staging makes a huge difference and it's important to do this. Um, oh, I probably should say we, we stage it. No, uh, there's no charge to our sellers for staging. Um, we do it because it sells the home quicker, we get a higher price for our sellers and um, it's the right thing to do. We have our own staging truck and our own staging team and our own staging furniture. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do. This is the same home in Malden. This is a bedroom with paint, looks a lot better and here it is with staging furniture. Um, it, gets an emotional response from the buyer. As soon as you've got that emotional response, they walk in the door, oh, oh wow. And as we said, oh, I didn't realize that I was telling this. I had it in there that we, <laughs> it's part of our services. Other agents charge for the service or the seller pays the staging company directly. We just do it as part of, uh, part of the fee, the standard fee. Um, so why? Why stage? Well, NAR say that 83% of buyer's agents said a staged home helped the buyers visualize the property as a future home. Okay, you want that happening. 25% um, of buyer's agents said potential buyers increased their offer between 1% and 5% on a staged home. So just, just think about the difference that is if you've, say, got a million dollar home or even a $500,000 home. That's a lot of money. And 85% of homes surveyed were sold for six to 25% more than homes that were not staged. Why would you not stage? Um, and why would you not see value in staging? There's huge value in staging. So let's talk about staging a little bit more. The norm, normal homes that we sell are occupied homes. So just because we say staging, we're not telling you that you need to get your furniture out. We will come in and work with your furniture in the home as well. So occupied are the norm, but vacant homes we also do too. Um, it begins with a pre-staging visit. We'll come and have a look and we'll prepare a recommendation of um, what we would do and what we would bring in. But it ranges from suggestions on where we should move furniture to or what should go into storage. Um, we'll bring in supplemental furniture and accent pieces, things like that. Or we'll fully stage a vacant home. But why is staging important? So this is one of the homes we bought on last year. So if we didn't stage this home, people would have no idea that that's the dining room. But because we had dining room furniture in there, oh, that's the dining room. A lot of, if you've got a, a unique home that's not a traditional layout, it's hard for buyers to work out 
what room is what and what to put where. We help them with that with staging. But it's even when you know it's a living room, this looks quite cold and utilitarian and even though it's got nice features, but with some staging furniture, that feels really good. Um, here's another example. Um, the, the home in Malden that we were talking about and again with staging furniture. Not just vacant homes, but also new construction. Um, staging the whole home is really, really important. Here's just a photo that we took um, just when it was getting ready to be completed, but here's the same room with staging furniture in it. Um, makes a, how many times have I said it makes a huge difference? Oh, it, every it, makes, it makes a huge difference. Um, here's, oh, here's the one <clears throat> that was the FISBO then on the market for a year um, with another agent and then FISBO again. This was how it was being shown. Now, up the front there was the living room. This middle room here was the dining room. You can see the chandelier. Buyers would walk through here and think, what's this room for? What, what's this room for? Um, so, by staging it, we staged it as a living room, we staged it as the dining room, and here it's pre or post dinner drinks room. It defined the space for the buyers so they, ah, yeah, that's how I can use the home. Makes a difference. Did I mention that? Makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, we listed, listed as competing offers sold for over the asking price. Here's another one. Um, this is just an empty living room and with staging furniture in it. But again, it can be an occupied home. Um, this is a home that we went into and you might be able to see there's two of those armchairs there, those same two armchairs are there, but we bought in some additional furniture um, and staged the room. Here's one. This home was on the market for three months with another agent, not selling. Didn't feel very inviting. Um, we came in, all we did was staged, supplementing their furniture. So you can see this, this piece is still the same piece that was over there, but we bought some things in for it. This sofa is the same sofa. This chair is the same chair. We switched out um, the rug. The, the rugs make a difference. You want to ground furniture with um, off-white um, off uh, carpets, makes a difference. We staged and we got competing offers for the home. Um, it, it makes a difference. Makes God, a difference. I need to get off that record. I'll, I'll think of another, I'll think of another word another soon. Another, another <laughs> phrase another you phrase. can overuse, right? <laughs> Okay, now let's get on to marketing. Marketing? All right, yep. so um, you've understood the market, you prepared the home, you've staged the home, and now having gone through all that, that effort on, your, on the seller's part as well, well as ours, of course, now the whole trick is now to get the home in front of the maximum number of buyers, the maximum number of buyers who potentially will make an offer on that home. So that's key. Um, the question really that gets asked often though is, does marketing matter when it's a strong seller's market? Um, and the answer is yes, I mean, it clearly does. Danny before outlined how many views of 3D Tour and the video, how much that, that, that directly correlates with how many private showings you get of the home, and then the number of private showings correlates with how many offers you get on the home. So there's a clear correlation between how many times somebody views the marketing and everything that follows after. This was much more important than perhaps it had been. It was more important during COVID than it was previously because often what buyers would do is they would go to the open house anyway. They would look at the photographs of the 3D tour online, but they would go to the open house anyway. And we common to have 50, 100 people through an open, a two hour open house over the weekend. Um, COVID kind of changed that completely and there were no open houses. Um, and we've seen the buyers shift. They've shifted to view everything online 
and then if it works for them then making a private showing with their agent right yep. even though open houses are coming back to some extent mm -hmm. that the buyer the way buyers the where the consumers really it's not just buyers of homes consumers in general they've shifted to that look at everything look at the digital assets the digital media of the home then having met, having looked at it and yes it ticks my boxes then I'll go and do a, a, a private showing. And that's why having high quality photographs, 3D tours, videos, websites, all of that in place is, is m much more important than it was previously. Um, but it will continue even as we get back to this new norm. Buyer's behavior has shifted so that they now expect that to be in place. Danny uh, mentioned before, you know, that correlation. And here it is you know, showing up on, on, on our dashboard, uh, the app that we have that allows uh, potential sellers, buyers as well. We have a separate section if you're a buyer. It allows not potential sellers. Well, real sellers, sellers actually. <laughs> yeah, real sellers and real buyers. Um, actually, what's happening with the home. And it really came out of some experiences that we had when we were buying and selling homes that there really wasn't the information that we, want, we needed at our fingertips. When we were selling our homes down in D.C., Right. We were using a great agent, but we had no knowledge of what was happening when and everything like this. And we didn't want our sellers to feel that way. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, so that's why, you know, that's was kind of the genesis of, of this. I mean, it's really about providing the maximum amount of information to both sellers and buyers in this market. And that, that really matters. Um, you know, you really should think of demand really as a seller in this market that you have photographs, videos, 3D tours, floor plans, websites. I mean, you name it, all of those should be there just because, as, as I mentioned before, that's what today's buyers expect. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, that's what having, having all those in place, getting those private showings means that you're going to get more offers and inevitably that means a higher price for your home. So it's really important. Um, photographs matter. It's the first thing that people see when they go when they look at a home online is the photographs. And here's an example. These are not our photographs. I should, yeah, we need should, to. Add, should <laughs> add they're not. But this is actually the same kitchen. But look at the difference professional photography makes. Um, the the one you know on the uh, the poor photograph there is actually being staged as well. But it just it it lets it down completely. Um, and when you think. Back to, you know, perhaps a lot of homes on the market, buyers looking at these two homes, they're the same ones, which one would they be more likely to do to organize a private showing for? Clearly, it's the one where the, the photography makes it look better. And we have example after example. Here's another one. Um, uh, you can see the hours there, a new construction right. home that we put yep. on the right hand side. That's our kitchen for, for, photograph. The one on the left, as you can see, are rather four photographs. Blurry. Somewhat out of focus as well. Um, here's another example there as well. Um, and so we can go through those. Um, I like the last one. The last one. No, oh, not that one. That no. I, like, I like the box of tissues in that one. That's really no. what makes that one. There's an example of, of an out of, fo out of focus photograph. Um, and then the, Look at this, this one is even worse. That's it. Yeah. So it Why? really... Why wasn't the seller complaining about that photo being on MLS and being on all the, the websites and things? Why weren't yeah. they complaining about that? Because that's... Anyway, yeah. Um, video is important too. Um, if you think about the way today's consumers um, look for information, almost inevitably it's through video. Um, it's through YouTube. Um, and so we have a whole range of videos that we put together targeted for different uh, pieces of information, but also targeted for different platforms that we're going to put them on. So, for example, top five reasons you love this home works very, very well on social media. Um, the, the standard uh, video we have there of, of the home kind of walks you through, gives you a little bit more context. Um, of the home than direct photographs would. Photographs kind of lead you by the hand. The video very much leads you by, by the hand. And then for, for a high-end home, we'll perhaps do a, you know, a lifestyle video as well. So there are different videos we use depending on say, what platform, what the home is and so on. So that's uh, really important. 
But all of the, the photographs and the videos, really, you know, we're the director, if you like. Um, what would be really good is if we allowed the end user, the consumer, the buyer in this market to actually walk around the home virtually. And that's what the 3D tour gives them. It gives them the ability to walk around the home um, as if they were in there. And I'll show an example of that in a moment, just to kind of finish up this section. Having got all, got all that information together, it really makes sense then to kind of wrap it up with a, uh, a website, put all of that information on a website. Oh, this is the one I mentioned just a little bit ago. It came on the market early November, a month or two ago. Right. Um, and for $2 million and we had competing offers on it and sold it for two two seventy. So, you know, this is where I was talking about yep. the fact that um, homes over $2 million still have competing offers if you price realistically. Right. Mm. Let me show you the, the website that we put together because all of this kind of information all sits within it. And I'll give you a run, uh, uh, run you through that 3D tour just to show you what that looks like. Um, the idea behind the website is really a single point for all of the information about their home. Um, the information about the home, of course, you know, what price is it on the market for? This one's closed. That's why, why it says closed next to it. Um, but all the information about the home, how many beds, baths, what kind of um, heating does it have, the taxes, all of that information on the home. And then walk the potential buyer through the home with a combination of narrative, which really illustrates the home, gives you a kind of sense of what it's like, um, and then the, the photographs. So here I'll just kind of run through here. And of course, you know, lots of photographs are important. Um, and so here you can see professional high quality photographs. This kind of... Cool. Uh, I was going to say this home was vacant too. So this is, this is completely staged by us. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. I should have mentioned that. Yeah. And as you can see, um, all of the rooms, the, every room has been staged. I mean, here's the office. Master bedroom, we may even have the other bedrooms up. And there we go, here's the other bedrooms too. So when the home is completely vacant, we'll stage the home completely. Every not room. just one or two, one or two rooms, we do every room. So that's kind of narrative and photographs. And then guess what? There's the 3D tour. And let me kind of fire this one up because I think it's useful to give you a, a quick overview of what, um, what the 3D tour does. So let me put that in full screen, hopefully. There we go. So. Everything else is to say, we're really the director. We tell you which way the photograph's going to lead you. We'll kind of, the, the video camera will take you which way through the home, but that's not necessarily what you want. You potentially want um, to look around this home at two o'clock in the morning and try to understand, you know, the layout, what was the master bedroom like, how big were the closets, all of those kind of questions. And the 3D tour allows you to do that. Um, you can go anywhere you want in the home. Um, we do all of the finished spaces. Sometimes we'll even do the unfinished spaces if there, you know, there's some potential down there. But as you can see, you can kind of navigate around um, getting a sense of that home. Not only can you can do it, of course, if perhaps, you know, family or friends want to look at it while you're looking at it too, they can do the same thing. So, you know, it's not like they need to be at the open house to understand the layout of the home. They can actually use the 3D tour to do that. You can go upstairs and downstairs. I'll cheat actually as, um, and kind of head up to the bedroom layer. There we go. Um, I'm guessing that's probably the master that's bathroom. That's the master suite. There we yep. go. And then we'll head back into the master. Um, and so you can see you kind of, you're able to go wherever you want within, within the home. What's also useful as well um, is to be able, the ability to show you the floor plan. But the floor plan, that not just the schematic, we have that too, but with furniture within it. So it will give you some context in terms of how big is that room in comparison to, uh, I guess that's a queen size bed. Um, that's a king. King. So it gives you a kind of the, the sense of that. So though that floor plan is really powerful as well. And, and the view that Danny likes, let me turn. Is the dollhouse. Let me turn <laughs> all of the floor. There, there we go, how's that? It kind of gives you a, a, a unique perspective in terms of what rooms lay underneath or on top of others. Um, great way to play what ifs. Um, you know, what if I add a bathroom? Can I add a bathroom over an existing bathroom and so on? Um, so that's a kind of a unique view of that, uh, of that home. Mm -hmm. um, 3D tour, there's the video, there's the brochure. 
Uh, we still produce the brochures. Um, there, there's that schematic floor plan and so on. So that's there too. And then kind of wrapping up I mean, as a single point for everything about the home. Here's the home in relation to the, in this case, the school systems. And there in relation to, uh, this is the Lexington home, the, the public transport, MBTA, as well as Lex Express and so on. So really giving a single point for all the information about that home. So that's kind of wrapped it up. Let me just go back to the PowerPoint. Um, that kind of wraps it up in terms of the um, uh, the website, kind of pulling everything together. So we, you've done all this work. All of that stuff is there. Now, how do I get this home in front of the largest number of people? And there's two approaches to this. One is a broad approach um, of pushing the content out to a large number of people. Um, large by large number, clearly within the area, you know, not California, if you will, um, but pushing it out and using social media to really um, uh, outline your series of three, just li four just listers, actually. We have you know, coming soons, using the, the platform to be able to get it out in front of a, the largest number of people. Potentially those people are not interested in the home, but of course they may, they may know somebody who is. So that's the first strategy is to go broad, and then having gone broad, the next one is to be very targeted. Um, targeting uh, potential buyers that we have in our systems, um, came to previous open houses that have interacted with us. You know, you, you were interested in this home, four bedrooms, three bathrooms, 3,000 square feet. Therefore, you may be interested in, in this home. So we're looking to target specific uh, potential buyers as well. So go broad in one. Uh, content um, one strategy but then the other one is to kind of narrow be very targeted yep. very na narrow it down so um that's kind of the, the the marketing what's really key you know marketing is key to getting the highest price is key to getting the maximum number of people into the home to through a private showings having you've done that you know getting that home sold as quickly as you can and it really this this works in no matter what market you're in it works in the very strong market we see today um, it's not just that this strategy has only works in in a, in a strong buyer's market it works very much in a strong seller's market and we can give you a, you know a simple example of that we gave one previously of overpricing um, no amount of marketing would have got rid of that but here's an example of, of a home that zero days on the market and unsurprisingly it came on the market at 869 and guess what it sold for 869 and in this market that's not selling for as much money as it could have because only one person saw the home offered right. the masking price. Absolutely. You know, and just a sneak peek to what we'll hear next week. In towns around, um, we can see 105, 109, 100. You know, ten percent. The average sell price to list price ratio in some of these towns is it's well over a hundred. In many cases, it's higher numbers than we've ever seen. Yeah. Very much higher than we've ever seen. So this is a, a, a very a, an example of where not enough people saw that home. The marketing didn't get a chance to kind of get a large number of people in the home and get the in this case the seller a, a very high price for the home. So marketing is very very important. Even though it's a strong seller's market, marketing is, is key to getting the maximum price for your home. And it's really that having all of those digital pieces in place because that's the way today's cute consumers are looking to buy homes. Okay, now we're almost there. Um, the last component is excellence through teamwork. Well, why is teamwork important to, um, to getting you the highest price? It's because we have specialists um, working on every component of bringing your home on the market. Um, you as a seller are the center of our universe. Um, and then we have our listing team working with you. We have our closing team working with you. Well, that's after the fact. But our preparation team, our staging team, the marketing team, they're all working on your house. Um, and they're all specialists at what they do, as well as the agent. The agent right. is working with you of as course. well. Of <laughs> Well, um, but it's, it's key to making sure that everything gets done and gets done right. Um, if you, uh, 
No, I, I won't go there. I was just going to say, if you use an agent that doesn't list homes very often and maybe one every year, have they got the floor plan organized? They don't even have a video person. They don't... And, and, and our strategy is to bring all of this in-house. Yeah. Unique, really, in, in, in the market. And the reason we do that is that we therefore have control not only of the quality, mm -hmm. we also have control of the timing. So for okay. example, it seems like a simple example, but it's really important. Um, we will stage in the morning and photograph in the afternoon. And video and 3D talk, 3D talk in, the, in the, afternoon. the afternoon. So why is that important? Well, imagine that you've got three young children um, and we say, well, we're going to stage on Wednesday and you need to keep the house neat and tidy until the following Monday when our photographer can be there. That's just not feasible. It really isn't. It, so, it's too stressful for us. Right. So the whole idea <laughs> here is keep all of, keep the control not only of the quality but also of the timing of this because you're right, that reduces the amount of stress on, on on the seller and if there's anything which is that the selling process is it's stressful mm -hmm. um, so anything we can do to minimize that stress is hugely important back to that kind of relax we've got this mm -hmm. but it's really about controlling not say not only the quality um, but also the timing of this and this is why we have this team-based approach yeah. because we think it's the most important we have specialists so there's the high quality we have control and that's where the timing comes in and yeah. at the end of the day this is why we can say with some with with certainty that you know relax we've got this because yeah. we actually have we're not yeah. Yeah. and and part of the thing too is that the team that we have um, we have some core values um, integrity and ethical behavior uh, we won't break that we will not break that I can say that absolutely categorically 100% we will not break that integrity and ethical behavior is too important if you mess up once your reputation's gone we will not mess it up um, and education not selling that's why we do these sessions um, we're trying to educate folks <clears throat> as to what's important, what you need to, to pay attention to. An exceptional customer service. We've got all of the people in the, that we mentioned before all working with you as well. So everybody's there working on your behalf because you're the center of the universe for us. Um, but it's also, you know, professional versus Aunt Mary. You know, you want a professional that does it day in and day out. Um, you don't want a three P's agent. So what do I mean by a three P's agent? <clears throat> this, is, um, this is a term in the industry. You have agents that will put a sign out front, a P, put a sign out front, they'll put it in MLS and then they pray. You don't want a three P's agent. And a lot of the agents around are three P's agents. But it's not just us saying this. Um, the, the, the NAR, which is the National Association of Realtors, commissioned a study as to what the biggest threat to the real estate industry was. And this was a year or two ago. What's the biggest threat? And the biggest threat was that masses of marginal agents destroy reputation. The real estate industry is saddled with a large number of part-time, untrained, unethical and or incompetent agents. This knowledge gap threatens the credibility of the industry. That's not us saying it. That's the National Association of Realtors, biggest threat to the real estate industry. Um, so it's important to use a professional. Don't just use Aunt Mary or your next door neighbor. Um, so, so who are the, the agents in our team? There's myself and Marcus. Um, we have Rachel and Corinne, uh, another Rachel, when Jen, Yuki and Andrew, um, you know, we're all there willing to help. We also have our support team. Um, most, so I have to point out, let me point something else. We have six full-time support folks. If you're talking about a large cold or banker office, they might have 80 or 90 agents in, in, the, uh, in the office. And they may have two or three support folks for the 80 or 90 agents. We have 
a small number of agents, but we've got a large number of support folks because that it's key to providing a repeatable product level, high quality, high product. quality quarter of product to both our buyers and our sellers. So that's really, really important to us. And Susan is our listing manager. Um, Sherry's our closing manager. They've both been with us for over six years now. Glenn's our marketing manager. Um, Christina is an interior designer and staging, uh, staging manager. Lisa's our broker assistant and Maria's our accountant and everybody it's it's like a family. I know that sounds really, really silly, but it is. It's it's like a family. Um but so what do you do? What are the steps to success? How do you make this happen? So get us in to advise you. Even five years in advance. Um I once went into a home, they're not thinking about selling actually it was about five years ago, they're still not thinking of selling yet. Um, but they were going to be painting the whole inside of the home and they sort of said what colors should we paint because it makes sense to just be able to touch up the paint when it's time to sell rather than repaint again so I had lots of fun because that's that's fun <laughs> I'm happy to do that <laughs> but plan your move um, you know where are you going when are you going do you need to sell to buy we can we can help work out those timing a buy and a sell but it depends on the finances and what sort of market you're buying into but start preparing your home start decluttering start doing the painting um, you know in advance or those sorts of things there's lots of things that you can start doing even if you're not thinking about selling in a couple of years Information's key on our website. Um, you'll see that there's a selling essentials video series. There's over a hundred videos in there on all sorts of topics, um, all related to selling. And get us in for a market analysis. Again, even if you're not thinking about selling for a couple of years, we're happy to do a market analysis and give you an idea as to what your home would sell for today. And when it's time to come on the market, we update it. Um, no problems but it's start thinking about it because it will make it easier for you when it is time to sell and then the excellence through teamwork it's partnering with you um, when it's time to come on the market and or beforehand or during you can reach out to anyone in the team and they'll help um, we want to provide customer service exceptional customer service um, we've started doing customer success stories. They're on our website and we, we do that. And you can hear what other people who have used us have to say um, because we're transparent. Um, and trans uh, and, and communication's key both ways. And what Marcus was saying just before, relax, yeah. we've got this. Relax, we've got this. Um, and we think that our client deserves to be the smartest person at the closing table and that we all benefit by becoming smarter about home buying and selling. Um, and guess what? That's it. <laughs> Look, if you've got any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out. Happy to get on the phone, happy to email, mm -hmm. happy to come and visit and just chat because as you can tell, we like talking about real estate. Um, and uh, look, hope you have you... lots of information to impart. Yeah, and, and look, keep checking out our blog page because we do um, put masterclasses on there all the time. Um, the video series, Selling Essentials, there's a whole lot of information and content on our website. We are actually redesigning it. It's going to be happening in the next couple of months to make it a little bit easier for people to see to everything that's out yeah, there. To navigate so, it. Yep. Um, but look, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate you being with us. We have a lot of fun when we do this and I get to correct him when it's time him. to correct him. <laughs> right, shall I, shall I say goodbye now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you thank for joining you. us. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.